Most of the time in audio world, we are mixing for stereo destinations. If we're going to a live stream, all video switchers have a stereo left and right. If we're mixing a record in a studio, that is stereo left and right. If we're mixing in-ears, stereo left and right. But PAs can be different. Live sound systems, yes, it's typically to, fair to give it a left and right mix, but our audience could be anywhere within the audience plane. It could be getting just the left, just the right, maybe both, there's front fills, there's delays. How do we handle that? So today I wanna to break it down to its most uh, irreducible point of just a single mono source. What if your beautiful stereo spatialized mix is just going to a single speaker that's maybe hung in the center covering the full audience, or it's going to a series of mono speakers that have uh, specific zones that they are covering with zero overlap. How do you make sure your mix is going to translate, especially if your mix is also going to other stereo destinations like in-ears or a live stream? We're gonna get on the same page between the key differences between mono and stereo first, then we'll jump into six tips for making sure you, your mix can stand up in a mono environment. Let's jump in. First, here's a primer on stereo versus mono and the stereo field and spatiality in general. Let's start with our most simplest component, mono. Mono as in monochromatic, uh, that it means one color. So mono is a prefix that means that just one. That'd be the equivalent of just one speaker sitting directly in front of us playing one source. And ideally in an anechoic chamber, we're getting no reflections, no sense of space at all that is mono. But we have two ears, so how do we deal with this as humans that have not a hearing device that's right here on our nose, but on the side? So when we localize or figure out where sound is coming from in space, our ears give us information. So if something is arriving at both ears at the same time, at the same level, and is the same source, we think it is coming from right in front of us. So you're hearing my voice, even if it's from a stereo set of speakers or a stereo set of headphones, or even uh, maybe a MacBook or something with speakers, it's imaging or coming from the center. And that's because, again, it's coming from the, those two sources and it's arriving at your ears at the same time, at the same level, with the same phase relationship or timing over frequency relationship between the left and right. So again, we can have a mono source going to a stereo destination and it will still carry its mono attributes. Well, then we can also take a mono source and move it around in the stereo field. So that, so that is called panning. So if we take that and move it around, different consoles or even DAWs are gonna handle that a little bit differently. So I'm gonna show you what that means with a pan law. What I've got here in Reaper is a tone generator doing a single 440 tone at minus 12. And I can see that reflected here in the BX meter that's showing the peaks or right here at minus 12. All right, but then it's running into this plugin called PanPot, which if I take it, I can use level to pan it around or move the signal around and we'll see what happens to it. So if I play here, uh, move it, we see that is all now on our right channel. So panning moves a mono source, basically removes it from the left and we see it increase from minus 12 up to minus nine. So when you think about it, well, I had it, coming in, how did it increase level? Well, this is a mono source going to a stereo destination. So it's gonna have it at its original level. But if we take what was on the left and then combine it to just on the right, we can do a couple things with it. That is governed by a pan law. So a pan law is right here. And why I like this plugin is I can change it. So this is a minus three dB pan law. And what this tells us, if we take a correlated source and pan it all the way over, we're only gonna get a three dB increase instead of a full six dB, right? Uh, because we don't want to have a uh, any one channel get overloaded. So it's a way to manage those levels. But I could put it at minus six, where it does give us that full output right there if we want, all right? Uh, I, minus three is a, usually a good place to go. Uh, this is, if we make it to a true stereo balancer, that means it's not even going to deal with the addition. Uh, it's only gonna eliminate the opposite channel. So your audio console, 
is going to handle this different. So I would test it by running in a sine tone and then panning it and seeing what happens to see what your pan law is. This is also going to affect if you have a stereo source going to a mono bus. Let's say you do run aux fed subs and you send in like a stereo Nord into it. Uh, that might push that, that mono aux beyond its capability because it's not fanning it out. We're getting the addition of those two channels because so much is correlated. Now that we're comfortable with a mono source, a mono destination, and moving a mono source around in a stereo field, let's take a look at stereo sources and the way they interact with each other and their containers. So here I've got a track that uh, I produced with an artist back in 2020, and we're gonna take a look at something called the mid and side channel. So the mid channel is the what is the common or 100% correlated between left and right. Again, how we talked earlier about how you're hearing my voice right now, right down the middle, it just means that's the same in the left and the right. That's what the mid channel is. Even if we're playing a stereo track that might have a guitar pan over here and a keys over here, you're hearing what is absolutely the same between the left and right if something's panned down the middle. The contrary to that is the side channel that is left minus right. So mid is left plus right, and we get everything that's the same left minus right gets us everything that is different. And we can see that here on this correlation meter. Here, I'm gonna solo this track and solo just the mid channel. And you're just gonna hear everything right down the middle. Oh, I could hear your Mustang from a mile away. Heart rate. Same channel in full, uh, same track in full stereo now. Oh, I could hear your Mustang from a mile away. Heart rate at a hundred when you exited. So if you notice the first time when I played it, the correlation meter it was full all the way up here because that means everything was correlated. That's what this measures. So this is correlation over frequency. So at all frequencies, if I solo the mid channel, and I'm going to mute this here so you don't hear it. Uh, but we're going to see that uh, it is all the same. And let's look at the inverse here. What if I mute the mid channel? Now it's going to bring it all the way down. And this is telling me that, hey, nothing is the same between left and right. So let's hear what that sounds like. I'm going to play it first in full stereo. Then I'm going to solo the side uh, signal. If you're viewing this on a mono sum destination, it's simply going to disappear. If you're on headphones or something that has two speakers, you're going to hear the side signal, which is going to get rid of everything that's in the middle. So full stereo, then we'll switch to side. Oh, I could hear your Mustang from a mile away. Hard Pretty cool, huh? If we solo the side signal, it sounds like our head's being turned inside out. That's because in the middle, our brain is trying to decode something where the two signals are the complete opposite of each other, which is very unnatural. It happens nowhere or in very little places in nature. But this is the exact type of uh, what we're trying to happen when we're doing a cardioid sub setup. We're getting two sound waves, the meat invert one of them, they're completely correlated and to cancel out, which is pretty cool. But in a stereo mix, we have things that are left over that are different between left and right, and that's what helps create this sense of space. Okay, now that we're comfortable with mono, stereo, mid, and side, let's see how these concepts translate into making sure a stereo mix can translate on a mono destination. Tip number one for mixing on mono PAs, still get stereo sources. I've worked with some folks who say like, well, if it's only going to go mono anyway, why are we wasting the extra channels? A lot of instruments or keyboards or guitar pedal board outputs have mono outputs anyway. And my rebuttal to that is you often now have a live stream or at least a set of records. A lot of bands carry in-ears and want those in stereo, even if the PA is not. They, they, <laughs> they didn't show up knowing that, so they probably have a lot of stereo uh, outputs. They might have tracks in stereo. Uh, so yeah, so live, live streams, records, and IEMs are often still in stereo, even if your PA is not. It's also good for redundancy. If I'm running two lines to the keys and one of them goes out, at least they have the right now, which is good. 
And then uh, just know that any sort of fancy pants imaging tricks of maybe like delaying one channel and creating spatiality is not going to translate well and that with more comb filtering and weirdness when it's being summed to mono. So still get stereo sources, uh, but you can assess their mono compatibility by listening to how they get push down to the middle and how they hold up. So anything that's been artificially widened or uh, using a lot of uh, weird phase tricks, if you will, to do that is not gonna translate as well. I'm not saying you can't put it in a mono PA, but just your mileage may vary. Tip number two is leverage your Z and Y axes. So Z is depth, X would be width. So if we, in a stereo environment, we do not have left to right panning. And this is true uh, for the most part, even with a stereo PA and live sound, depending on where the listener is. But let's say the majority of the audience is gonna be in the middle between two speakers anyway, and you can get some sort of stereo imaging. If that is lost, you just have a single center speaker, you need to make sure your mix holds up. So you need to be thinking about how can you expand your use of depth or height or the Y axis. So how I handle this is I'm more aggressive with rolling off top end on sources that don't need my attention. And that helps them push them farther back into the mix. And that also pushes them down into the mix. So top end actually has two different ways in which it affects placement in the mix other than moving them left or right. Because uh, our ears are primed to pay attention to higher frequencies. And, and so they, they literally get our attention. That's why when you whisper in someone's ear, just go psst, it gets their attention because has a lot of high frequency information. So I limit what has high frequency, high frequency information so that what I want to have high frequency information can stand out. This can be done with complementary EQ changes. So if I increase maybe 10K in a vocal, I could decrease it in my keys or guitar bus to make sure none of that is gonna get in the way. I also like using filter to delays to create depth. So this is maybe having a quick slap back on the vocal where I take the, the reverb or sorry, the delay return and I maybe filter it down to 1K where the delay isn't interfering with the intelligibility of the top end of the vocal, but it's separated and is behind it in a more filtered fashion and still providing that depth. I really like that trick. And I might start with a delay time of maybe 160 to 180 milliseconds. Another tip for dealing with this Z and Y axis is not using too much reverb to help provide the space. Most folks think, oh, I need to make things sound bigger, give it more space, and they immediately think of verb. It's not a bad tool to use, but oftentimes if you use it too much to, try to create this artificial room, it just sounds kind of fake because it's reverb coming from one place versus a multitude of places around you, and it ends up washing everything out and actually making things sound flat, like they're all in this pushback, very very distant plane, which I don't like. So I'm very selective about what gets sent into reverbs and I'm not using as many longer reverb times. Lastly here is I like using gated reverbs on drums because it's a quick hit that gets the verb and then it gets out of the way. So it's not decaying a long time and muddying things up. So again, the overall methodology here is just being very selective about what I add to a mix. And I'm usually much more aggressive with my subtractive EQ so I can create space and separation. Point number three is the rule of three. This is limiting what I'm presenting to the listener as I'm guiding them through my mix. So think of like a, a normal band setup, maybe two or three vocals, guitar, keys, drums, bass, on a verse that might be down in energy, I'm thinking like, okay, let's, let's highlight guitar this verse and I'll pull keys down. And then to the chorus, pull keys back up, bring in the BGVs. And the next verse is rolling around. I'm like, okay, well, I featured guitar last time. Let's give keys a turn. And of course, this is always dependent on the arrangement. You know, if the keys player stops playing, then of course I need to highlight guitar. But I am more apt to do more pulling down of other sources and give kind of these uh, selective mini solos, if you will, if I, especially if they're behind vocals. I just wanna create different interests and palettes behind the vocals as I'm guiding my listener through the mix. It's also that much more important when vocals aren't singing 
to make sure some sort of other instrument is stepping up. So if you do have rapport with the band or influence over their arrangement, how they're playing, make sure to communicate that. that Don't leave this gaping hole when the vocals stop that the listener has nothing to pay attention to. So like, hey, can the uh, lead guitar make sure and step up and provide a riff or a melody line? Or maybe you they are sending you tracks to front of house and like, hey, can you stem out or break out the tracks that have leads so I can make sure and push those during empty parts? So it just, I think you just have to work a little bit harder to be more active and involved with the mix presentation in mono, but it's definitely doable. And why I say the rule of three is that the human brain in general it has does a terrible job at focusing on more than one thing, but definitely can't focus on more than three things. So in a musical mix, you got the drums driving the rhythm, the bass and like foundational meat and chordal structure, and then something on top. So that's the three things I'm thinking of. Well, drums are almost always going to stay there. There's the middle meat, if you will, may function differently, more rhythmic and driving or more sustained and chordal. It just kind of depends. But then almost always there's a melody. So I'm thinking of how can I push and pull on each of these three elements to create dynamics and energy within a mix. Number four, if you know the PA is going to be fed mono, maybe you're just out of outputs to a bunch of different zones or it's only one speaker, Minimize the amount of overlap between zones. Again, like I just said, if it's just one speaker, it's just one zone. But if you have two, we want to minimize comb filtering or interaction between the two because everything is correlated or the same. And so if the li- if the listener is maybe standing two thirds off to the side between two speakers with correlated or the same source, you're guaranteed comb filtering because they're arriving at different times. And that's just going to create these peaks and valleys in the response that don't sound good. With stereo, if it is a decorrelated image from the left versus the right, that's okay because you're not going to get near as much because at least some of the mix is decorrelated. But this is still true for things that are panned down the middle, vocals, drums, which I don't like that comb filtering anyway. So just listen and assess, walk those zones and see if you can get them more separated without leaving a hole in the middle. All right, number five of six, the ideal mix position in my mind should be on axis with your mono main speaker. Typically we think of setting up front of house and the mix mix position in the center between the two. So if that is still the setup where the PA is just two speakers that are dividing the room in half and shooting down the center of those zones, I would opt the mix for on axis with one of those speakers, knowing that that's gonna be the most linear response or at least uh, where manufacturers are making sure the box is its most linear and knowing that the high frequencies are going to taper off towards the edges. So mixing in the middle, even if you're a little bit offset, guarantees a comb filter and you're not getting the on-axis clearest high frequency response from the box. Lastly, this mix is going to have to translate to other stereo destinations. So how can you make sure and check it? I would have a pair of in-ears or headphones handy at front of house. And on your cue bus or monitor output, a lot of them have a solo and a mono function. So I'd listen to be like, okay, how is my mix translating in mono to the stereo source? And take your headphones off, listen to the PA, listen to the mains. And if you are doing any panning that is in just the stream or the records, just know that especially if it's post fader and following what you're doing in the house that you're just gonna have to check. And again, this is uh, up to the pan law on your audio console. I would also be hesitant to pan something all the way left or all the way right without either a corresponding arrangement equivalent equivalent instrument. So it might be a rhythm guitar and a keys that's more rhythm driven. I'm, I'm okay with panning those out hard left, hard right, but lead instruments, it feels awkward if something's panned all the way to the left and doing a lead and back to the center with the vocal and back out. So there, I would maybe push it off a little bit to the side, but not rely on hard left and right on a live stream to make that happen. So again, put on headphones, audition it in mono, see how much is dipping between those instruments that are panned and make sure it still translates in mono. And this is just a good practice anyway, even if you are mixing on a stereo PA. All right, here's a quick recap. Stereo gives us a sense of space, but it's not required for a great mix. Oftentimes we're mixing uh, on a PA that gives us a different spatial representation of what the live stream of records are. Collapsing our mix into mono means we're adding left and right together and and that's what is summed together. And the opposite is true for our side signal is left minus right and that's what's left over. 
all signals have varying level of correlation with each other and that will go away in accordance with that correlation. So uh, it is not a zero or a one. It's not everything is mid or everything is side, but that is the extremes of that equation. I would still get your sources in stereo if possible, because we often have stereo destinations, even if the PA is mono. I would mind your pan law and stereo field, and you can send a test on through a channel, send it to a bus and pan it around and see what happens with those meters. I would get on axis with the main speaker for your mix position. Make sure and leverage your Z axis, and that is depth and Y, that is height. So using selective delays and filtering uh, to bring off top hand to bring depth. And then it's usually EQ that is able to alter the, the, the Y axis and managing what has top end precedence to sit on top is the biggest reason and way you can influence it. You should leverage the rule of three. So giving your listener no more than three things to pay attention to at any one time. And then make sure you monitor your stereo destinations in mono with in-ears or headphones on just to get a different look. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. My name is Michael Curtis. Love getting to unpack some of this for you. I'll catch you next time.